Okay. I do see that we have uh, three council members on the on the Zoom. So we do have a quorum and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Is that okay? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, you may begin when you're ready. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, as I stated, good evening. Hi, this is Council Yolanda McCoy. I am the Chair for Education, Youth and Families. Today is Wednesday, January 12th. It is 5 p.m. and it is time for our Education, Youth and Families meeting. Um, I would like to start by doing a roll call for the members of the committee. Uh, okay, I do see that we have um, Councilwoman uh, Gray. Present. Okay, Councilwoman Fields. Present. And uh, President Congo. Here. Okay, thank you all. So uh, we like we actually had three presentations on the agenda today, and we'd like to get started with just well we have two updates and one presentation. We'd like to get started with our presentation uh, from the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. Is that let me see? Are we? Uh, I said, who's here to speak to that matter? Jim, Jim Simmons, DUE's Chief Equity Officer, and, and I, John Sheehan, are, are both here, uh, Councilwoman McCoy, and we're happy to, to go through the presentation and then, of course, field any questions from the, from the committee. Thank you so much. Us, and you have the floor. Wonderful. I'll kick it over to Jim to, uh, to get started. Uh, I'm, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I apologize. Um, so I don't know who is controlling the PowerPoint, but I'll just say next slide. When appropriate. So the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, I'm sure at this point you've heard uh, the buzz around around Newcastle County. And so what it is, is a framework of different um, innovation zones, for lack of a better word, that we've seen in different cities across the, the country. And we've taken that framework and tried to retrofit that into the Wilmington area to say that we want to collaborate with the districts that reside in the city and try to build something together in, in hopes of improving outcomes for the students who reside in our in our city and attend our city schools. Next slide, please. So here are some of our current challenges. This isn't all of them, and these aren't just limited to the city of Wilmington, but um, when the DSEG order um, kicked in, in in the mid to, to late 70s, it caused a, a fragmented governance structure for the city of Wilmington. There are um, three different school districts and, and four, if you include um, Newcastle County Vote Tech at the high school level that oversee students in the city, Red Clay, Brandywine and Christina, and then Newcastle County Vote Tech if you talk about high school. And what that does is students living next door block over oftentimes are going to different schools or if they move from one place um, very close to where they currently reside. They're now changing governance structures, um, maybe curriculums, um, certainly le leadership at the building level. We know that this our, our population of students ha has a tendency to board, be more transient. And so when they, when they are transient, that governance structure that I just spoke of becomes an issue because they're now changing um, and sometimes within a year, sometimes maybe within a couple of times. We also know that the, the facilities of our, of our three districts are held at different um, levels of expectations on what they look like. And so we, we currently have an MOU with Christina to bring those buildings to a higher, higher standard so that whatever comes out of the Reading Consortium, if, if redistricting is a part of that, that those facilities have been updated. Um, I, I'll reserve the recruiting and retention comment till later, but we know that all of those challenges plus many others lead to high absenteeism rates and then also it impact uh, student achievement and we see those low achievement rates across those districts. Next slide, please. So this is the reten teacher retention data for our city schools over the over a three year period. And if, as you notice that the state average is about 66% and all of our city schools are below that. 
that doesn't mean that they're all leaving the profession. They could be leaving to go to different districts. They could be leaving to go to different schools within their district. But we know in our city schools, the retention rate is lower than our state average. And as a former principal, the impact that has on your community, with the impact it has on professional development, the climate and culture you're building is impacted. And so one of the things we hope from this collaborative is collaborative is the opportunity to improve those retention rates. And then re as, and as we recruit, obviously we know we wanna to try to recruit and retain them in those buildings, not just come for three years and leave and go to, go to another place. Um, next slide, please. So here's what the structure looks like. We're asking what I call the big three, Brandywine, Christina and Red Clay to volunteer to be part of a collaborative that we can build something together. We've created this shell um, that you see on the slide before you. And then from that slide, we'll work with the, the districts that decide to participate. And I, I frame it that way because that's exactly what it is. It's a coalition of the willing. We're asking those three different districts to to partner with us to build this together and build it from the ground up or better yet, from boots on the ground where we have teachers, administrators, building level administrators working, giving us feedback that will help build what this will look like. We, we hope to put in place a trustee board that will be made up of in some parts, um, the superintendents of those districts that decide to participate and the city representative who's on the school board and others. Again, what that board looks like completely is to be determined because we don't want to come with a with a, a, a prescribed structure. We want to build that together with those folks. That trustee board would oversee a small staff that would oversee the day-to-day -day operations of those schools and those the schools of those districts that decide to participate. And the important thing I, I need to add is that the, the schools are, are not leaving their district. They'll stay in their district. They're just gonna to collaborate together on this Wilmington Learning Collaborative. Next slide. So what could it look like? One, it's um, who decides to participate. What we've heard is that, um, or, or I guess our goal was to work with uh, elementary and middle schools. We've heard that people want to have um, high schools be a part of that equation. We're not saying that they won't be. What we're saying is let's start here. And as we build this, we'll continue to work and have conversations on how the high school piece could be included. We, 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 I mentioned a small staff that would focus on those schools. Um, one of the things I've shared in the number of meetings we had, I, I think we're upwards of 110, 120 meetings now, but to say that in a typical school board, there are seven folks and one of those folks is delegated to the city. And so if you just use simple math, 14% of that vote is focused on the city of Wilmington. We're, we're hoping to create this board that their sole focus is gonna be on the city of Wilmington and that staff. So I also need to add, cause I think it's important as a, as a former educator um, and a district employee for, for a number of years, this isn't a blame game or a pointing the finger game. I think it's a capacity issue and that's the way I'm treating it. And we're hoping that we can take this support as a capacity issue and a resource that we can give to those districts and to those schools. We wanna empower educators oftentimes their voices um, aren't included in the decision-making. What we're saying is that uh, we wanna do something with you or build something with you versus um, building something for you and doing something to you. Um, we, we think that we need to include the community in that. Um, later on, uh, John will speak about the number of community groups that we've spoken to to get their feedback and making sure that when we look at what needs to be done, we're getting information about what those folks in those communities see as important and try to include that in the plan as best we can. Uh, this collaborative, we hope to make it flexible around how, how they spend money and, and, and how they use their operating costs, but it also talks about flexibility around their scheduling, talk flexibility around how, how and who they hire and how they use the staffs that they have. And we think that that can get that flexibility will be able to address some of those issues that we talked about prior to. And then I did talk about remaining in their district, that's important for everyone to hear. We're not trying to do the work 
um, in lieu of what the Reading Consortium may come out with at, when their deadline meets. What we're saying is we think that this is a good first step to get folks working together around the table um, around what, what we feel can build something together. Um, we talked about initially this collaboration. Collaboration could be around a number of things, professional development. It could be around curriculum if the, if the group of folks who participate decide that's the way that they want to go. Um, and so I think that that's important to know that, again, we're, we're not coming to you with a prescribed plan. We're coming with a shell asking you to participate with us, join with us in, in building this together. Next slide. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, so as Jim mentioned, we've really tried to lean into the, the community engagement aspect of this. We've held, as Jim said, over 100, I think we're at 122 or so, Zooms, calls, engagement opportunities, meetings to make sure that we are hearing from educators, from families, from students, from community leaders, from elected officials. And so this is not an exhaustive list of everyone we've met with, but these were the groups that we could fit on fit on one slide. But I think it just shows that this is something that we really value and are going to continue to value as we build this and sustain this. So uh, appreciate certainly each of these groups who have, who have hosted us and met with us. Uh, the governor and, and Jim and I spent uh, half days at a few of these schools, and we'll continue to do school visits. We had public engagement meetings that were um, hosted in person, streamed live, and recorded at Harlan, at Warner, at uh, Bancroft, and at, at Pulaski. Uh, and I see uh, Dr. Joyner and Superintendent Green, who were kind enough to host us for, for those meetings. Uh, we have also, as I mentioned, gone door knocking and met with families uh, and students um, at their homes to, to hear about their experiences, met with a number of community groups and elected officials. And again, we'll continue to do this. Uh, and then also met with city educators from each of the three districts to hear from them about what they're experiencing every day, what their students are experiencing, uh, and what we can do to, to support them as this gets built out. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as Jim mentioned, as I want to really sort of um, build upon is that this is an iterative process. And as we get feedback, uh, we want to incorporate it in the plan. And this is something that has to be a partnership and collaboration. So one of the pieces that uh, we've amended this PowerPoint to include uh, is that folks were asking about specificity around funding. And so as the governor announced on Monday in his recommended budget later this month, he's going to bring forward an additional $14 million for uh, disadvantaged students. And that's going to be really in two pots. One is to put the Reading Consortium recommendations, which had been uh, funded with one-time funding for the first year, putting that in the operating budget so that that's a year after year um, item. And then the second 7 million is for the Wilmington Learning Collaborative schools, the schools that participate in this. And some of the things that we've heard from educators, from families, from students, from community members and elected officials are the need for additional staff and additional uh, paraprofessionals in classrooms, the need for enhanced wraparound services, extended day programming, uh, and that's a really important one. I want to make this clear. Our educators in the, in the city and, and across our state are doing an amazing job and we can't ask them to work any longer. And so this is about partnering with community groups for that extended day enrichment opportunity um, to make sure that children are getting that, that after school experience. Um, also focusing funding on retention as Jim mentioned, uh, and then some of the operational supports and early childhood experiences that we want to see children have as they uh, progress and enter kindergarten in the collaborative. Uh, and one thing at the bottom of the slide that I wanted to emphasize is that uh, the resources here are really going to be the, the allocations are going to be determined by those on the ground, those educators, families, uh, community members. We want to make sure that this is, this is responsive to the needs that those closest to students see. So uh, we're excited to be able to bring forward these additional resources and look forward to working with uh, school communities on how they're going to be best, uh, best allocated. Next slide. Uh, another piece of feedback we received was around the timeline, and we'd heard uh, really loud and clear that uh, a lot of folks felt that it was too compressed, uh, and we really have an urgency around this, but we want to do it right. And so uh, the timeline is something that we have amended, and so the uh, this year, winter, spring 2022, uh, what we're asking for is our school boards to take a, uh, two votes. The first vote is to move forward with exploring this partnership and having their superintendent and the superintendent's teams and, and perhaps board members um, 
help start working on these MOUs, convene collaborations, working with our educators uh, to help build out these MOUs. And then the second vote would be to approve the MOUs that are created. Uh, that first year, and this is where I think the, the sort of um, feedback has really been, uh, folks really wanted to see that first year as more of a planning year and, and making sure we're not implementing this all at once this, this September, but really taking time to make sure we are engaging educators, engaging families, engaging students, engaging the communities. Uh, and so the first year is really going to be a planning year, but with those added resources that I mentioned on the previous slide, we don't want to wait to provide that support to, uh, to our schools. So the 2022-23 school year would be really a planning year with added supports and added funding, and then really beginning the implementation that, that following year. Uh, next slide. The final piece of, of feedback that I wanted to, to highlight that Jim mentioned was the high school piece. And, and certainly um, Dr. Joyner's district, the Christina School Board really emphasized that this was something that was very important, that this is a, this is a model that that has some really exciting parts, but ending it at eighth grade is something that they really wanted us to take a hard look at making sure we included that high school piece. And so Jim is a former uh, high school principal, so he can certainly answer sort of more specifics on this piece, but looking at really a short term and a long term strategy and the short term working on bridge programs for students helping with high school placements, we, we've convened conversations with Newcastle County VOTEC around Howard and, and knowing that there are additional seats at Howard and Howard just had uh, about a hundred million dollar uh, upgrade and so making sure that there are pathways for students who want to stay close to home and, and go to Howard while we work on a long-term strategy and, and that's something that we want to work with the collaborative on work with the districts on and work with the Reading Consortium on on that long-term high school piece. Uh, next slide. So final slide and then we'll stop talking and, and would love to hear questions and have a conversation but as I said we are asking school boards to take two votes one to move forward with formally exploring this partnership. And then the second one, once we have collaboratively developed MOUs, which again, will really create a framework, uh, a second vote on those. And uh, Christina had their meeting last night and they voted uh, seven, seven zero to move forward with this. Uh, so we're really excited to begin that, that important work. Uh, Brandywine and Red Clay will be voting in early February. So um, exciting step last night and, and some really great work ahead. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, the invitation for Jim and I to be here, and um, Madam Chair would love to open it up for any questions that the that the council members might have. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, thank you for the presentation for, from you and Mr. Simmons. Wanted to find out whether or not anyone had any questions. I do see one. Councilwoman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions. Um, one in the list of the lack of or the tension um, teacher retention, I didn't see P.S. DuPont. Um, so they're not a high school, but I want to know what is their teacher movement also. And the other question is, um, you were talking about um, tracking students. Do we have uh, truancy officers anymore? So I, I'll speak to those. I don't know that John has been in a, in a uh, worked at a, in education at the, in, the, in the state of Delaware. So we do have um, visiting teachers. I don't know that they're called truancy officers anymore, but they do track the truancy pieces. And, and, and really that's a parent issue in terms of, it sometimes causes those problems. And so they, um, <clears throat> for those parents, and sometimes those parents are doing the best they can and it, and it becomes a student issue. So we do certainly have that. Um, but around PS, they're, they're about, at, at, I want to say 48%. I don't have it in, in front of me. We, we didn't include them initially because we didn't think PS fit the mold of the other schools in the city because of their gifted program that they have in there. Um, so, but we did look up that data because that question had come up before. Thank you. May I follow up, Madam Chair? Uh, yes, you may. Um, back to the visiting teachers, um, but you were talking about tracking students. So, um, I used to preside over a uh, truancy court, and I do agree that is a problem for the parents. And usually that was the reason the kids weren't getting to school. But that did help bring the kids to school to have the visiting teachers track them down, their new address, what relative they were staying with. So um, we're not using that tool anymore to bring kids back to the school. No, we are. Um, so I, like I said, they're not called truancy officers. I think they're called visiting teachers. Now, at least in Brandywine, they were called visiting teachers. And we do use that tool to try to get them. And sometimes we end up in court 
Um, I'm trying to think of Lynn's last name. From, Lynn Nichols, when I was in Brandywine, was one of our visiting teachers. And so she, she certainly did do that. But um, I think that one of the things that has helped um, with attendance is it's part of our report card um, for our accountability. And so I think schools and districts are doing a much better job of tracking them on t- earlier to make sure. And then some of the other things that got put in place is oftentimes what I think the term was duplicate students. When, when we talked about students moving from one district to another, they're ending on, on both lists. So I think districts have done a much better job of tracking duplicate students for a September 30th count. So there's a number of different things that have helped with the absenteeism, but we're still not getting them all. And so we hope to put some structures in place so that we can reduce even that number that's been reduced and being handled much better now. Um, but I think we still have some work to do, obviously. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Councilwoman Fields. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one question. What um, kind of resistance have you gotten um, from trying to uh, bring this program, this collaborative together? I actually wouldn't call it resistance. Um, and John can jump in on the back. Or hesitation, end. I'm sorry. Hes- I'll say hesitation. I think it's more mm-hmm. questions, right? I, okay. I think that the, I'm going to say that that rub has been folks want to have answers to some of their questions. And what we're saying is we don't want to bring a, a prepared framework to you. We want you to partner with us to build it. So I think that's an uncomfortableness that, that folks are having to say, I'm uncomfortable not knowing the answer, yet you're asking me to participate. And what we're saying is participate and help us build it together. And it's not a structure that's been used very often. So I think that's where that, I like the word uncomfortable versus resistance or hesitation. But I think um, to John's point, when we've met with these 120 different meetings, because it wasn't 120 different groups, we've taken their feedback and tried to incorporate it into the plan and try to adjust it. And I think that is helping folks to see that we are truly listening and that we are truly taking their feedback to heart. And so we, we hope that that's closing the gap. I think the seven to zero vote in, in Christina last night um, showed that um, they hear us and that they're willing to at least engage. Adam Chair, okay. may I follow up? Oh, yes, you may, Councilwoman. Um, my other question is, um, did I hear you say that you would also um, help them with the curriculums um, in the in the schools? So one of the one of the examples I gave early on in the presentation was should we or could we consider having common curriculums across all the districts? It was an example and I and I I have reservations about saying that now only because I think that's still unfair for me as the, the chief equity officer to, to, to determine that curriculum is one of those pieces. If in fact those participating uh, schools, districts decide that they think that that's a good idea, then certainly it, it could and should be. And we, we would uh, support that and pay for that from um, the state level. However, I think that there's other opportunities that they collaborate together, meaning um, classroom management. There's a different type of classroom management skill set that's needed when you're uh, dealing with inner city that's not so needed in the suburbs. They have, they certainly have their classroom management skills. So I think professional development around for folks that are all dealing with a common problem or common set of issues, I think that's an opportunity to do that as well. Again, I don't want to suggest what it would look like. Those are just examples of what it could look like. One more question. I'm sorry. I'm an educator. So one That's more okay. Question. Ask as many as you want. That's why we're here. That is fine. You may proceed. Thank you. So my next question would be, um, some of the kids may have IEPs. They might be in Title Ones. Um, so are you going to, how, how do how do you see dealing with that um, in, in the collaborative as well? Um, so I, again, I think that the structures that we have in place around Students um, with with uh, IEPs, those districts have uh, educational diagnosticians. They have their um, and their IEP teams and their special ed teachers. I don't know that we would redo the ratio of special ed. We certainly did that for K to three. Correct me if I'm wrong, John, for uh, that ratio for special ed. So we hope that that will generate more units for those students at that age group. But I think that again. 
the systems or the structures that are in place would remain in place. But around the collaborative, if we thought that that was something we need to address, I think that that getting those people around the table to say, we need to look at those structures and what can we do differently for those students who are, or have been identified. Okay, and the, and the training for the individuals that's the, the teachers or the pair, um, I forget what they're called, pair educators that come that start working with the collaborative. Are you going to teach them that management skill if they don't have it? Are you going to start? Are you going to prepare them how to deal with the inner city kids? You know, some may come hungry, some may not have their clothes washed small shoes big shoes are you going to be are you going to prepare them for that classroom or that yeah, and classroom? that's what I meant when I spoke about there's some different challenges of working in an inner city and and and, I, and we could argue when we talk about retention rate new teachers not and, and that it doesn't relegate anyone because of your birthday but people who haven't experienced that they need to to learn how to manage that slightly differently. I don't know that I'll say this. When I was at the University of Delaware and I did my methods class, that was not something that they were teaching me when um, when I had to go work um, when I left school. So I think it's something that, again, getting around the table to say, we need to have this kind of professional development for these skill sets that these teachers need so that they can manage that better. Um, and, and, and be better prepared to handle that, right? So I think it's all of that's on the table and we wanna be able to provide what the teachers, parents, students, building level administrators say that they need. And so our goal is to find out what they need and then help get it for them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, take the time to recognize that we have both uh, Councilman Darby uh, on the, uh, at the meeting and report her as a, a president and also Councilwoman uh, Michelle Michelle Harley. And I do see that Councilman Harley has her hand up. You may proceed, thank, Council. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of uh, those from Christina School District, um, Mr. Simmons and Mr. Sheehan, I believe. Um, I represent um, Bancroft. Bancroft is in the 4th District, um, which is on the east side. And there were a number of parents um, that had shared feedback with me um, that I had shared when we met with the governor, I guess, two to three weeks ago, because to my understanding, um, this is a document, a fluid document that is being drafted um, and that is in a development stage. So I had like three questions and I do apologize that um, I jumped on a little late. I got off of another meeting and I will wait until later, but um, later, I wouldn't have the opportunity to ask the question. So real quick, um, one of the questions that some of the parents were concerned about was a need for a high school. And the governor and his representative have pretty much said um, that that wasn't on the table as of right now. And one of the questions that I had was, is it possible for it to be in the MOU, maybe down down the road, maybe two to three or four years? So, so was that considered in the MOU, a part of the draft? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, hi, Councilwoman. So yes, we have, that is one of the changes that we've made in, in our presentation is to add that um, we heard loud and clear from, from Christina School District specifically and, and their board and community members and, and when we met with you that that is something that the community really wants to see included in this plan. And, and the way I think you just phrased it is perfectly that, you know, we don't want to tackle too much at once, but that as we build this out, that that should be a component of it. So we heard that feedback loud and clear, and that's absolutely something that, that we're adding into this. Awesome. And then my second question, is it okay, Council, uh, Madam Chair? Yes, you may. You may proceed. Okay. Um, the second question was the flexibility around the start date. Um, a number of parents and people from the community um, were trying to buy into this, trying to wrap their, 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 their mind around the whole concept. Um, however, they felt as though that the, the start date seemed a little bit um, aggressive. So did was there any changes in terms of the flexible start date in terms of the implementation? Yes. So we um, absolutely the probably the other biggest piece of feedback we heard next to the high school was the timeline and, and folks feeling like it was they appreciated the urgency, but that it was just a little too compressed. And so what we've done is that we've made next school year really a planning year. 
Um, as I mentioned, the governor is coming forth with, in his recommended budget, um, additional resources, and we want those resources to go to schools immediately so that schools can you know, hire additional staff, put those enrichment programs in place, but really taking next year as a comprehensive planning year to work with stakeholders to build this out and then really doing the implementation the following year. So we've heard that feedback and, and have adjusted the timeline. That is really, really awesome. Um, and then uh, the other question was the makeup of the governing body, um, who was selected members. And I believe um, one suggestion that I had made was that um, as it relates to um, the Wilmington um, municipality, in addition to the mayor on the legislative side that we have two representatives on the governing body. One, uh, our um, education, youth and family um, chairperson, um, whomever that may be at the time, and then an at-large council member. That was another question that um, was put out there during that meeting. Yes, so the, um, the trustee board is something that um, Jim had spoken a little bit about that we, we don't have a sort of specific set of exactly who's going to be on it. I think one piece of that that's going to be determined is do all, all three districts choose to opt in, do two. Um, and we want to make it representative and having, you know, educators, having parent representatives, having you and your colleagues have suggested uh, city council representatives. And, and I think the challenge that we're all going to have to work through together is how to make that trustee board community-based and as reflective of the community as possible while still keeping it at, at a size that allows it to do business. So I would I would love to keep working with you and your colleagues on sort of the, the makeup of that and, and how we can make it, again, as inclusive as possible while still, you know, kind of small enough to, to conduct business. So a long way of saying something that we absolutely need to keep working on. I'm glad to hear that. And um, just sort of wrapping up, you know, my, my three questions. Um, I'm glad to hear that because as I had shared in that meeting, the council members, the district council members, especially, um, they, they're the ones that are the boots on the ground out there um, going to civic association meetings um, and actually connecting and, and making contact with the, the parents and the families and those that are in the community. So when you think about um, uh, uh, the Wilmington municipality, it's not, it's not, you know, and I'm not taking anything away from my mayor because I know he plays a role in this, but he's not going to be the one out there connecting and hearing the voice of the community. It is the um, council members that are out there, like I said, going to the civic association meetings, going to the homeowner association meetings. So that was one of the main reasons why we wanted to make sure that um, council, uh, city council members were being considered for those reasons and those reasons only. And then lastly, um, you had mentioned about some collaborative initiatives in terms of um, curriculums. And I would think you were thinking about that from the perspective of what is working, what is not working. And of course, if it's working, and we all know, well, at least I've heard a lot about the Red Clay School District, how they have some very, very good models. And would it be possible that you would be considering models um, from those districts that you know are working and those, those districts that have models that are, are, are effective? And that's my last question and point. Yeah, so when we mention curriculum, um, we, we're not suggesting that everybody has to scrap the curriculum that they're currently using. It could be that the collaborative as a group decides there's there's evidence that supports that. And I'll use your example that Red Clay is using is working extremely well. So let's mm -hmm. adapt that to the other two, for lack, mm -hmm. for lack of a better example. And then mm -hmm. the state would pick up the cost of those other two having to buy that new curriculum if the collaborative wanted to go in that direction. So are, 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 we're not suggesting that everything that's being done is awful and let's get rid of it all and start again. We're, by no means are we saying that. What we're saying is if, and I, I'll use uh, Darrell one because he's on this phone call and two because he's a friend of mine and he knows it's not directed in a negative manner. If he has something that's working extremely well, then we'll take that and say, hey, Darrell, you've got evidence that supports this. I'm sorry, Superintendent Green, you have evidence that supports this. The other two districts could decide that they're going to do the same thing, and then the state would take on that cost of getting those, those resources for that district. 
Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Chair, um, Madam Chair. That's all that I have. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Councilman Harley. I do see that Councilman Gray has another question. Yours. Thank you. <clears throat> it's more of nuts and bolts. Um, how many schools in the city are relegated to the three districts? Like, um, doesn't Red Clay only have one school in Wilmington? The Red Clay has um, four. Lewis, Shortledge. We have four elementary Denver schools. Highlands, yeah. Four elementary schools, and what about the? I want. To, what about the other ones, Christiana and uh, Brandywine? So, so Christina has uh, fired in, in Bancroft, Stubbs as a, a dual generation center. Uh, so there's three, and then there's also been conversation about um, Pulaski, where the students in in Byard currently are, mirroring what Stubbs is doing with that dual generation focus, uh, and then Brandywine has Harlan, and then as as you mentioned, before Councilwoman PS as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if there's no other questions, actually um, going back to one of the slides, I did uh, look at your teacher retention rate and I seen that that was like one of the primary things that you had brought up initially. So one of uh, the question, I think you put it where it's like, this is like a three year. Is that like a three year contract that you're hiring these teachers on? So I was just trying to figure out why is it that it was based on three years? The, the retention rate? Um, I, I don't know exactly why they picked three years. John Neubauer, who oversees our educator support for uh, the Department of Ed, um, all districts are at, at some level are participating in um, what we call mobility surveys or exit surveys. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it looks at when they leave, whether it happens in their first three years, why they leave, whether it's because of the reasons X, Y, and Z, and compile that into some data. Um, and so they look at all that data and that's where they come up. We do know that nationally that educators who leave, leave within the first five years. And so th I think that's why we picked three to look at that three year window. Um, and so we think that if we can get them the three to five, we can get them the se seven to 10. Um, and so um, the first three years is wh where you're gonna get inexperienced teachers going like, oh, I, I'm not ready for this and we've got to go. I, I would argue that um, the IHEs need to revamp their teacher prep programs around the fact that you you wait till you're a senior um, traditionally to be in a school to find out if it's something that one, you still want to do and then you can do. And so here you are a senior, your parents have put out um, X number of dollars and then you go into your student teaching and you go, oh, this isn't for me, right? And so um, those are some of the conversations on a, on a much larger scale that I think we need to have. And our IHEs are willing to have those conversations as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so actually one of my council members actually brought up professional development. Uh, when it comes to uh, the teachers and the paraprofessionals. Uh, cultural competency is something that's actually, uh, I've had to do that in different um, different aspects of organizations I've worked for. Culturally, you know, the city is much more different than the suburbs. What do, what, uh, how is the districts uh, making certain that they prepare our young teachers for working in the city? Uh, is there anything uh, that happening may be at this a moment? Yeah, that may be a better question for we have two district administrators, but I will tell you at the department, we've just worked on we've our own professional development on on creating a, a definition from the Department of Ed around culturally responsive education. And so we hope that that will guide that work. Um, and but I think that and I don't want to put them on the spot, but Superintendent Green or uh, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Joyner may be able to speak to what each district is doing individually. I don't know that I could give any examples okay. off the top of my head. Right. Well, thank you. Well, actually, so I could ask those questions later. I, I didn't know whether or not they wanted to speak during your, uh, your presentation. So if there are no other questions. I, um, you know what, I, I'm sorry, the last thing that I did make certain I put down was the Reading Consortium. That was the very first thing that was listed when they talked to all of the people, all those, the folks that you've actually connected with about the, um, the Wilmington uh, Learning Collaborative. So that goes to show that this is actually not from the Reading Consortium, that you guys are working together. But will the Reading Consortium actually have another, do we expect a new plan or something maybe a little different, a tweak to this, if they come out with something different since they have been working to try to figure out um, our education system here in Delaware? 
Sure, I, I can start, and then I would obviously um, I wanted to defer to, to Senator Lachman and and uh, and uh, Attorney General Dan on, on that. But um, Councilwoman, we really view our work as complementary to to the Reading Consortium's work, okay. and that this effort will hopefully make whatever their final determination is hopefully smoother because we've started that additional investment in these schools and started working to attract and, and retain educators in these school buildings so that whatever that final plan is this really i think is complementary to to their work um, and so that's that's certainly how we view it all right thank you very much mr sheehan all right so i don't have any other question as i don't see anyone else has any so I do thank you so much, Mr. Sheehan, Mr. Simmons, for coming and uh, be doing the presentation for the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. Um, I know that we will see you again. We've been seeing you quite a bit. And uh, just make certain that the, uh, the people in the community are always knowing what's, what's happening. Thank you for having us. All right. I said you have a great evening. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, moving forward with the agenda, we do have an update from the Christina School District, and it's based on our co the COVID-19 response. But if there's anything else you wanted to make us aware of, please do so. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak to this, this update for Christina School District? Good evening, Madam Chair. It's Deirdre Joyner. I'm here on behalf of the Christina School District. Um, I bring greetings on, to, on behalf of our Superintendent Dr. Dan Shelton. Um, he's with his wife who is um, giving birth um, oh. as we speak. Well, they're in the hospital, so we'll see how that goes right. for them tonight. <laughs> um, so um, thanks for the opportunity to give you guys just some updates on what's happening um, in Christina. Have you've heard, as you've heard, we were the first district to um, for our boards to agree to um, engage in negotiating an MOU to take steps to join the collaborative. So the agreement to engage in the MOU is not agreeing to join the collaborative yet, but it is to in, uh, engage in those negotiations. So we look forward to that. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I just had a couple of cover slides and some great pictures of some kids. So our next slide just has a couple of bullet points if you go to the next one um, that I'll highlight. Um, in terms of the COVID surge and what this means for us, it's a truly a challenging time for all of us um, and the surge that we anticipated is among us. Um, our goal is to keep schools open, but we wanna do it safely. So um, all of our students have Chromebooks and headphones if they need them in case we have to pivot at any time. Um, that's what the science keeps telling us, um, again, to just be ready to pivot. So um, we've been um, excited about our mitigation strategies and how they're working and that the data firms that there's no COVID in our schools um, in fact, according to the CDC, schools are actually one of the safest places you could be. In Christina, we've installed sterilizers in every classroom. It's a device that helps um, the HVAC sort of pump cleaner air. We're still utilizing um, what we call a focus on hands, face, and space. So we're wearing masks. We're trying to keep that space and washing hands often. Um, making sure, uh, again, that we have masks on hand for staff and students who need them. Um, and we also use a very interesting substance called biotech that we treat all of our substance with, um, our surfaces with at schools. It's like a shield that sort of repels germs and bacteria. So um, we deep clean, um, we make sure that those surfaces uh, remain treated. Um, and um, when there is a case or when someone, because we do have positive cases, uh, but we deep clean and move folks back in safely. Um, every day, our team has a spreadsheet of all the adult absences in our schools. Um, we look at our kids and we determine whether we can open and operate um, safely for all. Um, you'll notice that last week we had some schools on remote and some schools um, in person. And again, that's the work of that spreadsheet, helping us keep um, track of our absences and how we can open safely. Um, just a couple other really quick updates. We have what we call care teams in every school. Um, this year, every single one of our schools has a social worker, a counselor. We have deans, behavioral interventionists, and behavioral health consultants, family crisis therapists in some of our elementary schools. And these folks are all assigned to help us to help families and kids. Um, Byard and Bath Croft both have wellness centers that opened this year. Um, Stubbs has a satellite of that wellness center. It's run by the Life Health Center. 
Um, and it's like having a medical center in the school where they can get physicals, mental health, counseling, COVID testing, and even vaccinations. Um, Stubbs has the dual generation center. It's a community center with access to state and social services along with job training, housing assistance, rent assistance, just about anything for our students and families there in the Wilmington area. Mrs. Anderson runs that center and um, is happy to assist. Um, we also have renovations going on in all of those schools. Uh, Bayard is being renovated as we speak. So um, they're slated to open up by the end of next school year and it will be um, another beautiful building. Um, right now, those kids who go to Bayard are split between two buildings. Grades one through six are at Pulaski and grades seven and eight are in our pile building on, on Lombard, on Fifth and Lombard Street. Um, the Bancroft School is getting a brand new building and this, um, we're building this new school between 5th and 7th streets from Lombard to Pine. And on the third Tuesday of every month, we hold a community meeting um, for, the, for that area, for the Bancroft community to get updates on the project and to talk about how it will impact those in the community. Um, it's also an opportunity for the community to share their thoughts and provide um, some input on the project. Um, and lastly, Stubbs has been renovated. So if you haven't had an opportunity to see that beautiful building, you definitely want to get an opportunity to stop down there. Um, so our district office, which is currently at the location where the new Bancroft School is going to be, we're actually moving out to make room for that, for that new construction. So those are my updates today. I'll take any questions. OK. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Trina. Uh, if any of my council colleagues don't have any questions, I actually have one. Your relocation, where will you be relocating the, um, the district office? We're moving to Glasgow High School. We're going to share some space with them at Glasgow High School. Okay. All right. And so now when it comes to, you say you're having meetings every third Tuesday, of, well, every Tuesday of every month, third Tuesday of every month. Yes, at how, the Bay uh, How well attended are those meetings and where are those meetings located? You know, we have conversations, uh, Councilwoman Harley and, and other folks have been there. We've been having conversations about how to get more attendance at those meetings. So we have, um, we're working with safe schools and some other folks that are helping us get flyers and doors and make more advertisement with using the website and email and all kinds of uh, media outlets to get more um, attendance at these meetings because we really want to hear the feedback from the community. So it's getting better, Madam Chair, but we'd like to have more. Okay. No, I do understand. I wanted to find out whether or not were you meeting in person or whether or not you had uh, resorted back to you know, like these virtual meetings. As so we they have. have still been in person um, and we are, we will pivot to virtual if we need to. Right now, the one scheduled for the third Tuesday in January is still in person. Okay. But we will make that call if we need to. Okay. All right. So there's no other questions um, uh, for Dr. Joyner. Dr. Joyner, if you can just, um, I guess, basically put the uh, promotion out for your meeting, the day, the time, and the location for your next meeting. And I'll make sure that gets shared with you, Madam Chair, as well. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you already had a. Uh, I, I, can, I can get that for you. Yes. Um, and Shannon Griffin, I'll make sure that she's um, she's on the ground helping us with those flyers and all too. Okay. Oh, I do see we have one of our uh, council members. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Phils, do you have a question? Yes, it's, it's more like a thank you um, <laughs> to the superintendent. Um, she helped me out so much the other week and um, I was pleased with the way that the um, that Christina School District, how they did, um, you know, how they, they transferred my daughter from one school to another school. She met a counselor. Um, she met everybody. So I just want to say, like, sometimes people think, like, the public schools are not on their, I'm going to just use another, like, on their dean or doing what they're supposed to do. But I just really want to say thank you so much for all the legwork you helped me with, for all the emails that you um and the names and the phone numbers that you gave me. And I just wanted to go on public record that you all are, are doing a very good job. And to see that you, that band, what is it? Buy your moves to uh, Sarah Powell. It's like, it's run like a well-run machine. 
So just kudos to you. Congratulations to you. Um, my daughter won't be there for the new building, but you know, I just want to let you know you are doing a good job. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for those kind words. I will pass them along. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> All right. So thank you. So uh, thank you once again. Um, I appreciate you coming to give our actual um, an update for your school district. Right now, it does seem a little the um, the uh, parents are kind of like a little uh, concerned whether or not uh, their children will be going back to school. Uh, I do have noticed because I am one of the um, parents, I guess, a duplicate student or something. I'm getting phone calls from Red Clay, Christine. I'm like, OK, and my child goes to a charter school. So <laughs> so I do have I'm getting a, a updates from both school districts finding out exactly how the schools are trying to handle this COVID surge. And I'm glad that you're using whatever technology is available to make certain that we are aware. So I thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jordan. And if there's nothing else that you wish to add, we can, uh, I can say good night and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much. I will certainly stay to listen and support my colleague, uh, Superintendent Green here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I say, and last but not least, Superintendent Green, thank you so much for joining us. You are on the agenda to give your uh, COVID response updates for Red Clay. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you to all of the council members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to come before you this evening, just to kind of give you some general updates. Um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll backtrack just a little bit. Um, as everyone knows, uh, state and district received what was called CARES or um, additional funding to really look at how we were going to support our buildings around mitigation strategies. Um, so we've improved everything from air quality, um, how we cycle air through our building, um, everything. If you go to Cab Callaway, for example, we put outdoor tents, um, outdoor learning spaces. If you go by Warner, for example, we have outdoor classrooms. Um, so that was the big thing, right? Ventilation and how do you improve HVAC and ventilation? So we, we've invested a lot um, of resources in that, as well as uh, PPE, um, you know, personal protective equipment. We have mask mandates, cleaning supplies, um, safety protocols, signage, you name it. Um, to, to Dr. Joyner's, um, you know, point, we, we really heavily invested in, you know, those types of mitigation strategies. Um, as a district, we've hosted 11 vaccination clinics thus far. Um, 72% of our staff members are, are vaccinated. Um, and there was a vaccine kind of mandate, so to speak. As of November 1, all of our staff members have either had to be vaccinated or subject themselves to uh, weekly COVID testing. And so we have um, weekly surveillance testing in all of our schools uh, through an organization called Quidel. Um, so families can uh, sign up for weekly surveillance testing as well as our staff members, again, who have not um, secured a vaccination. Um, we also have a test to stay program, and that's to limit um, the quarantining of students who are healthy. So for families who may or students who may have been deemed close contact can participate in um, basically daily testing um, as a test to stay strategy so that they can stay um, in school. Um, we, we're open. All of our buildings are open. We have a rolling kind of uh, process um, for our secondary schools, our middle and high schools. We've identified basically thresholds. Um, around staff capacity within each of those buildings to ultimately determine when and how we would shift uh, to a remote um, type of setting uh, if schools are impacted by COVID. Our elementary schools, um, basically the threshold, we look at classrooms, grade levels, and then schools in terms of how we prioritize if we would have to shift to remote. Uh, being mindful that we are a large district, we are the largest district in the state, um, and so there are different and varying impacts of, of this ongoing surge in, in differing schools. Um, every child pre-K to 12 um, is equipped with technology. Uh, that's one of the things that we did early on. Um, so we continue, again, to work through those processes as it relates um, to COVID. Students have access to all of our wellness centers um, for vaccines. If they would so choose, again, families need access to that. So all of our high schools have wellness centers. Um, and we also have wellness centers established at Warner and Shortledge Elementary. Um, and we will be working with uh, Christiana Care, who oversees those vaccinate, I mean, those um, two particular wellness centers to offer additional vaccine clinics to those families who might have or not be able to access, um, you know, vaccines and want their children vaccinated um, in the coming weeks. 
Um, generally speaking, you know, it's it's the same thing that everyone is dealing with, so to speak. But we we are, you know, um, on our game as it relates to providing as enough as much resources and support as we can. We know um, we've increased our behavioral health support staff as well, um, using CARES funding, knowing that many of our students, especially when they were found themselves and families found themselves in that remote learning environment, isolation. Um, we, we saw our risk assessments increase um, as a result of online behavior students, um, you know, having ideation. So we've increased our behavioral health and support staff um, throughout the district and, and, and in our schools. Um, so we continue to monitor that as well. Um, and just the other couple of things that's not COVID related. Um, we do have a new principal at William C. Lewis Dual Language Program. Um, so Dr. Dr. Natalie Ortega uh, Moran started on December the 13th. Um, so we have new leadership there. Um, we will be renaming Highlands Elementary. Um, we'll be renamed um, Dr. Joseph E. Johnson Elementary School um, starting next year. Um, and we just want to give a shout out and thanks to all of our community members, our community partners, because it's just not a district effort. Uh, this truly is a collaborative effort. We continue to support um, learning pods. We have roughly about 215 students who participate in after school programs and learning pods um, throughout the city, um, supporting eight different community based organizations, everywhere from a Frame Boys and Girls Club, um, West End Neighborhood House. Um, Center for Structural Equity, LACC, Network Connect, um, Hilltop, or just to name a few of those community-based organizations that we continue to partner with um, to really support students and, and families throughout the community um, through the learning pods. And that's a uh, partnership with United Way of Delaware and those specific community-based organizations. Um, I would rather have a dialogue and conversation. I'm sure you probably have more questions than um, so I'm, I'm open to entertaining any questions that council members may have. Okay. And I see Councilwoman Darby's hand is up. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Green. Uh, Councilman Darby, you have a question, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, yeah I, you know, my district is Red Clay and I'm also a Red Clay um, mother. So all of my children are in the Red Clay School District. Um, I had, my daughter actually had COVID and was out of school. And one of the things that I know was an issue for me, and I don't know if there's going to be a plan, was that there was no plan for her to get work done other than they told her just to log on and if a teacher posts an assignment, try to do it. So, like, there's really no plan for um, children when they're home to be able to still participate in school if they can. And my daughter was asymptomatic, so she was just home for 10 days. <laughs> Like just in her room quarantine on her phone because the school didn't provide anything other than if your teacher posts an assignment on, I don't know what it's called. It's like a blackboard or Schoology. So or we whatever. have Schoology, which is a learning management yeah. platform um, relative to that. Last year when we were in the terminology of rooming and zooming, um, when we when we basically were mandated by the state to offer hybrid. Right? So families had a choice last year of whether they wanted their child to remain at home or to remain in person. And with that came the imbalance of staffing. And I think one of the things that we find ourselves in a position now is a limited staffing. Um, you know, there's a sub shortage, there's a teacher shortage. Um, but what I would say in that Councilwoman Darby, if, if any family um, finds themselves in a position, now we do have a remote option that families can choose to participate in, um, which is at Edmentum. Uh, program, but that's for a program when, again, students or families decide that they don't want their children in school versus in person. But if you find anyone finds themselves in a position where they feel like they're not getting adequate access um, or opportunities, I would first say reach out to uh, your particular school. And obviously, if you don't get the answer or response from the school, uh, reach out to the district office. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Can I follow up? Yes, you may. Yes, yes. So yeah, that's what exactly happened. And I reached out to the, the nurse who I was speaking with and they told me that that was it. So I think like the communication to parents that there is a remote option isn't getting out there. And I'm a parent that asks questions, a lot of questions. So, and they were telling me that was the only option, but that was like in August or no, that was like not August, probably like October-ish when that happened. Um, but yeah, just the communication, I think, to parents, just increasing that about there is a remote option for their kids to learn because I didn't get that. 
I, okay, and that's fine. I would just go beyond the nurse, but I again, I, I respect that, and if, if don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right, thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Green. Uh, are there any other questions um, from any of my colleagues? And I don't see. I have seen two in uh, two in the attendance for the public. Well, so I'm actually very glad to hear that when it comes to um, the uh, vaccinated. So 72 percent of the teachers are vaccinated. And then you're doing a weekly for uh, for those who uh, who have opted out. So is there any way that uh, how are we testing or are we asking the uh, the parents or leaving it up to the parents in order to test for the children on whether or not they are uh, COVID positive? Like, how is that testing going? So again, it's, it's for families who want to participate in the, the weekly surveillance testing, they, they basically sign a consent to participate in all of our schools offer that. Um, otherwise, you know, there are the testing clinics, Warner, um, is a steady site, although as of recently, um, I think with the capacity from the state level, they've adjusted and they continue to adjust um, some of those sites. But Warner, Warner typically is a static site for us within the city um, where families can access the curative testing. Um, again, we have the ability to provide, and I know the county was also providing uh, at-home tests yeah. um, and test availability. Um, and so there, there continues to be as short as we continue to direct families to resources. And actually now we have a third option that the state is providing um, through the Department of Health called Bionext Testing um, that our school nurses, and I will give a shout out to our school nurses. Um, they've been under siege mm. um, throughout this entire pandemic. Um, and and their, their work schedule truly has been 24 seven, 365. Um, you know, our, our nurses, you know, through contact tracing, through um, you know, phone calls and support um, have, have been God sent, truly doing, you know, a, a, a well beyond what, what they're being paid to do um, to support schools, to support the community um, as it relates to COVID. So um, test access to testing is, is continues to be a challenge in the community, um, but we try our best to avail ourselves to, you know, testing for families. Um, and direct them to those locations. And again, as of now, we've been told that we should be priority as it relates to what the Department of Health is now looking to support to help us maintain you know, safe, orderly schools and keeping our buildings open. Okay. Um, well, I thank you so much, um, uh, Superintendent Green. Just wanted to say uh, congratulations to your new principal at the new school. Um, my son went there. That's how I ended up in the red clay Peter pattern. He went there for uh, kindergarten. And the last of uh, my last question would be the renaming of Highlands. How did that come about? How did that come about, uh, about whether or not it had anything to do with the, was it more so, I guess, uh, district or was it community? And who is Dr. Joseph C. Johnson? Is he important <laughs> to know her? <laughs> Dr. Joseph E. Johnson is, you know, and God rest his soul, is the man. Um, okay. and, and, and it's unfortunate that, you know, um, his history and, and what he's done in terms of Wilming the education within Wilmington, but more importantly, in the state of Delaware, where it isn't as widely known as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, but the renaming of the school actually started with, um, he was the first African-American black superintendent in the state of, uh, in Red Clay, excuse me. Um, he also was instrumental in leading um, the desegregation of schools within the city of Wilmington. Um, he was a former principal at P.S. DuPont um, and again served as superintendent of Red Clay. And if I can look over my left shoulder, um, that's probably the only picture that I have um, okay. outside of my family in my office as a result of me meeting uh, Dr. Johnson when he was um, honored by Dell Tech um, during Black History Month a few years ago. Um, but his family wrote an op-ed in the news journal and reached out and we kind of worked together um, with the family and with the community um, because we felt it would be a fitting honor based on his legacy and all that he's done um, in the arena of education, but more importantly, what he's done for so many of our current community leaders and leaders in education, serving as a mentor to, to so many folks um, and being a behind the scenes guy that it would be fitting to, to carry on his legacy and name a school um, after him. So we went through the process. We have a renaming process in terms of our board policy 
uh, that we went through with the community and um, the school will be renamed after him. Okay. I said, well, that's, that's great to hear. Um, thank you so much for sharing that uh, brief um, like summary of what uh, Dr. Johnson has actually done and how he's been so um, important to Delaware education. So um, if there's no other questions, um, I oh I I actually have put out a little bit of information about the school choice program on a, a two minute drill last month. Closes so tonight. To tell, I'm sorry. I said the window closes tonight at eleven yeah. fifty nine. So just wanted to make certain that everyone knew that the window closed this evening. So the school choice education is now, uh, it was, began, I think, November 1st. It ended tonight. And so, um, you know, hopefully the, I got a chance to do two-minute drill and wanted to remind parents that this was happening. And so uh, I only got two responses to let me know. Thank you so much because um, I forgot. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to make certain, actually it was the conversation that we had that made me aware of how important it is that people know the time frame and when they need to take care of this. So I do thank you so much for, uh, for offering that information and also a contact uh, person for me to get more information from. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Yeah. And again, if there's right. any questions among any council members, regardless of where, you know, what district you represent, what school it's involved in, if we can be of assistance and direct, you know, council members or families in the right direction, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. So with that being stated, um, I am going to uh, state a good evening and ask uh, to adjourn this meeting. Can so I move. move? Motion to adjourn. And a second. Second. All right. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and providing that information. You have a great evening. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Great Thank evening. You.